Okay. Thank you very, very much. I wanted to start by actually saying hello, namaste, as we say in India, and shalom, as you all say. It's a great, great pleasure for me to be here. And just so everybody knows, this is actually my third trip to Israel. I came when I was a student, also at a graduate school of communications, uh, doing my master's to visit Jerusalem. I came two years back to Haifa for a fantastic conference that we do annually, which is called Wikimania. And this is my third time now Tel Aviv side. So I feel like I'm also getting a very nice sense of the country and different aspects of the culture. Before I actually move on, I would really like to thank Wikimedia Israel for inviting me. I consider this a great, great honor. And I particularly want to thank Dror and Itzik for looking after me with such care that I feel like you're about, all are my family here now. Yeah. So thank you very much. OK. <clears throat> now to go on with what I'm here to actually talk about. <coughs> the, I thought I would sort of lay out the broader issues around gender, knowledge, and Wikipedia, <coughs> some of which uh, Dr. Lemel Strike's letter already talked about, which has made my job much easier, actually, because I can pick up there. So let me just, <coughs> first of all, say why I wanted to start with this image. And before doing that, one very, very important thing. How many people here edit Wikipedia? I must know the general. OK, so quite a few. Great. <coughs> OK, so quick question, looking at this photo, would, can anybody guess who the Wikipedia editor is? The young woman. OK, so the thing is, yes, the young woman was the Wikipedia editor. And the reason I put this photo up is because I think it's a very charming story where she goes to her grandmother's house, which is the older woman. The grandmother has recently taken a computer learning course and has got a certificate. And the young granddaughter is very enthusiastic and says, come, let me teach you editing. And they take a song. We have a famous poet called Rabindranath Tagore. And his work is out of copyright because it's 150 years since his birth. And the grandmother is a fan of his music. So the granddaughter says, why don't you put up one of his songs on Wikisource? And then she starts to create articles. I like to share this because it's inspiring for many reasons. It shows something about the gender gap. I think it also tells you something about how we can reverse knowledge, right? We always think of older people as the teachers and younger people as the learners. Here we see something else. And here we also see a generation gap being sort of erased and people being able to participate in the digital economy as equals. So that's the reason I wanted to get to that. The, this is a very quick one where I just want to introduce myself so you know where I'm coming from. <coughs> I think uh, all of us at Wikipedia are familiar with the concept of neutral point of view, which is what we aspire to in the articles that we edit, because we rightly believe that encyclopedic knowledge should be much more objective than it should be subjective. However, all of us know, and I started life as a journalist after graduating from a school of communications, that we all come with our points of view. We all come with our own biases, subjectivities, whatever you want to call it. And so this is my attempt to actually tell you where I'm coming from, which is, first of all, I run a nonprofit in India, which is called Point of View. And we promote the points of view of women through media, art, and culture. That's my day job, which has got severely affected after I got involved with Wikipedia. So I'm trying to combine the two. Um, the other thing is I'm also a documentary filmmaker and a nonfiction writer. And so you will see that I tend to combine images and text a lot. And the third thing which I want to draw your attention to is actually the image. You know, this is a little bit of gender theory. In the old days, when we thought of women and men, <coughs> and I would say this is in the early years of women's studies, we thought of them as somewhat separate. We thought of women here. We thought of men there. And we saw them as a binary, right? Today, in women's studies, it's changed. And we no longer think of gender as 
a divided world. We actually think of it as an arc or a continuum. And in this arc or continuum, I bet if we did an exercise in this room and we actually drew it, you would find that different people, regardless of whether they are men, women, transgender, whatever, would place themselves at different positions along the arc. All the women would not be at this end, all the men would not be at that end. <coughs> the place I place myself is actually at what I call the 51% mark, which is sort of you <laughs> just about cross over to being a woman and perhaps that's because I was raised as an only child, I don't have siblings, so I didn't have sort of a gender point of reference. It may be because I speak a language, my native language is Bengali, which does not have gendered objects. And the easiest way to explain that is actually, like German has gendered objects, like der, di, das. In Bengali, nothing has gender, including pronouns. So it's a little bit of a, yeah. Which is not to say that obviously that, you know, so I was looking for an image on commons and I typed in androgyny and this actually came up as a nice image which I felt captured where I'm at, which is a mix of what we traditionally call masculine and feminine. <coughs> okay, back to the issue that we are wanting to talk about. So from 2011 onwards, studies have shown that Wikipedia editors are largely male. This particular slide is from the editor survey of 2011 done by the Wikimedia Foundation where about 5,000 editors who self-selected themselves replied to a series of questions and that showed that from the people who replied and 5,000 is, you know, the total number of Wikipedia editors is actually 80,000 plus all over the world active editors. So as you can understand, 5,000 is a... Ah, thank you, yeah. 5,000 is actually a small sample, yeah. Uh, but from the people who replied, it was seen that 90% are male, 9% are identify as female, and 1% is transgender. <coughs> thank you, I'll now have some water. Mm. Okay, moving forward, what I want to actually draw your attention to is I don't think the reason I called my presentation not just a numbers game. I think the importance of the numbers is that they indicate something. I don't think we should get too caught up in whether the numbers are accurate or not. They are indicative of something and that's actually good enough. And all the studies that are done, and I'll draw your attention to the first one, which is by the United Nations University in 2011, that was done with 175,000 respondents, which showed that Wikipedia has 14% women editors. Yeah? And then the others are also mentioned here, the one about Hebrew Wikipedia, you all will get into in more detail, so I won't go into it. Am I doing something which is making a sound okay? <coughs> so what I wanted to say is that one thing that I will draw your attention to, though, about the statistics, is that these are not random samples. These are all self-selected samples. And we know that from a statistical point of view, nobody can ever survey the whole population, right? So a random sample takes away certain biases and allows you to get a more accurate picture. A self-selected sample merely means that those who show up answer the survey, which means you may do a second survey at a totally different point in time and get somewhat dissimilar results. But I think it is valid in some ways because the self-selected sample also shows that the people who are currently there are more likely to reply. So it does sort of capture the state of knowledge at a particular point in time. <coughs> okay, and this is again just to very quickly look at from the editor's survey, it was found that in certain countries this was the level and you can see that India where I come from is particularly low, there's only 3% uh, sorry? Three percent is very low. 
and actually we'll come to i think some of the you know differences between different countries and why the yes this is the three percent is from the indian editors who replied only three percent were women yeah yeah so that is extremely low yeah okay now the sorry i've skipped a slide somehow okay no i forgot to ask the question that's what yeah my flow went okay so the question i actually want to ask is that you know beyond the point i think we all agree but i'd like to say it why does it really matter if more men contribute to wikipedia than women and I think to really get a sense of the answer, we have to think a little broadly. So I personally think it's a little narrow to say that if we get women, that we should sort of treat them. I don't want us to think of women as instruments, right? So I don't want us to think that, oh, if we get women, they will only write about X. They will only write about Y. I would like us to think about women as full human beings, as rounded human beings, who when they come into Wikipedia and bring their knowledge, will bring that full diversity of knowledge, right? So I think the reason we actually want women to come into Wikipedia is because our mission is to ensure that everybody can freely access the sum of all human knowledge. And I emphasize the word human. And what we are seeing, and I don't mean it in a bad sense, but I'll say it just to make the point, is that we, if we want to fulfill our mission, we can't, we are currently fulfilling more the sum of all or more male knowledge than human knowledge, right? And again, I'd like people to think of this outside the box of gender. We want women for the same reason that we want people from Korea, people from Malaysia, people from India, etc. Because different be where you come from means that you also bring a slightly different knowledge with you. And we see that, for instance, if you all were to compare the articles on Hebrew Wikipedia with the articles on English Wikipedia, I bet you would find that there's much more in Hebrew Wikipedia which is of interest to this particular community. Right? So that's what we mean by there is no objective, like one knowledge as such. It is different overlapping pools of knowledge. And I actually want to read out a quote that I think actually captures this very, very nicely, <coughs> which is when we think of women and knowledge, this is some, somebody wrote about it in the context of literature. As long as people think, that just because a woman writes a book, that the book is primarily of interest or pertinent to women, we will be missing out on the full recognition and acknowledgement of the richness that women add to literature. And that's what I am, want to emphasize, the roundedness, not a narrow perspective or just particular issues, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's very, very important how we theoretically think about this because there is a concept again in women's studies called essentialism. Essentialism is a concept where we, in, we attribute certain characteristics, certain interests as essentially women. And we found that that doesn't actually correlate with women in real life, we, right? Many, many women look at it and say, that's not who I am. So does that make me not a woman then? So this is actually the reason we want to emphasize the roundedness of women's contributions and knowledge. <coughs> okay, if we look at it from the viewpoint of the knowledge that is currently on Wikipedia, this is actually a slide from Wikidata, which is sort of a meta project that tries to give you information that uses Wikipedia as a source of data, right? And uh, get, gives you the results. Now, this is actually looking at, you know, what they did was they just took the word sex by language and they looked at biographies across many different Wikipedias. And they found that the top part, which is the orangish part, are biographies, male biographies. The second part, which is the 
blue part is female. And even though it says there's a green part, I actually cannot see it. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it again goes to show that from a knowledge perspective, what we want is we want the orange and the blue to come much closer together, even if not like equal in an artificial sense. But we see that that is not at this point of time yet possible. Ah, the video. Yes. Yes. So I just wanted to show you a video actually of. I love my yeah. students when I what? Yeah, More than a subject, I love my students. My name is Balasubramanian Pungodai. I'm coming from India. I'm a math teacher for 33 years. And uh, I retired from my career. And after that, only I started uh, editing in Wikipedia. See, I got a retirement from my career. So all the 24 hours is for me now. My sons have grown up and they are looking after their life. I am freed from all the responsibility. And this remaining years are completely for me and I am enjoying this. When I participate in this Wikipedia, what I feel is I am engaged as well as hmm, we leave something for our future generation. Algebra, analytical geometry, geometry are the topics which I am comfortable with. First I started with probability. The first article I have started is probability. Every day I am on Wikipedia. I am uh, simply at home. So I will do all my personal works and then I will sit with my netbook and I will edit and I will create articles and I will create articles on mathematics and then Tamil being my mother tongue and uh, my favorite language I edit the uh, articles created by the others for spelling mistakes and grammars everyone is benefited by this whether they are rich or poor here by a mere click the whole world is in front of us this is giving the complete information through internet without any caste. It is a really a great thing. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. So I wanted to show you that again for two reasons. One is to challenge the assumption that women will only edit in particular topics. Uh, and two, just because I think it's a nice, uh, inspiring sort of example. Now, and it alludes to something again that was alluded to, which is time. She says that now I've retired, I'm free of my responsibilities, I have enough time to be able to do what I want to do. And that's a very real concern for women. Moving forward, one thing that I want to actually ask you all is that I personally, you know, was not surprised when we found a gender gap in Wikipedia. And the reason I was not surprised is because we have seen similar gender gaps in what is called STEM. STEM means science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the reason I want to again show this image is because it's particularly cruel in one way that you have this kind of gap. If you look at the history of computers, one very interesting factoid is that before electronic computers were invented, do you know who did computing? Sorry? Yeah, and in what context? So basically after the First World War, uh, during the First World War, the US Army hired large numbers of men and women to do certain calculations, which were sort of very lengthy calculations. They were actually called computers. That's one of the earliest uses of the term computer in this century, in the last century. The reason women were hired is because it was easier to pay women lower wages, right? And so there was a link between women and computers at that time. And it always reminds me of sort of, you know, women cook at home, 
but then you go to a restaurant and the chef is always a man. <laughs> yeah, and it often sort of happens in that way that the power structures, the recognition sort of gets transferred to a sort of male domain. So this is very similar. At a particular point in time, women were themselves called computers, but then we get to the you know, life after the electronic computer is invented and what do we see? There are many, many studies. I'm just showing you a couple here. One is that in the United States, we see that only one in seven engineers in the US is female. And I don't know if you all experienced this, but when I was growing up in India, if you were a girl and you wanted to go to college, you were automatically told, yes, yes, you will do the humanities or you'll do the social sciences. And in India, it was very popular if you're a boy, you were expected to go into engineering or medicine. So this is something that I'm familiar with. Similarly, here's the interesting thing. Even though female graduates in the US hold 60% of all bachelor's degrees, less than 20% are in computer sciences, right? And this is what I mean by the gender gap in Wikipedia is actually building on an earlier gender gap in women and technology and what is called STEM as a short form. So moving forward from here, what have I pressed? Okay, yeah. Why do we sort of let's look a little, you know, sometimes we can learn from history. <coughs> if we try and look at how the gender gap came about in STEM, it will give us some indicators, not all that will be useful in our work. So one of the earliest things is socialization, which we've just discussed, right? Women are told, you know, in an earlier generation, it was thought that women were inherently bad at science, technology, engineering, and math, because there were such few women. It was later realized that it's not that women are inherently bad at these subjects. It's just that women have much fewer opportunities to study these subjects. And I'll give you some very common examples of socialization. If you take a family where there's a computer and it's not people don't have their individual laptops, where is the computer more likely to be kept? Is it likely to be kept in the son's room or in the daughter's room? Who is likely to be given more time on the computer? Is it going to be the boy or the girl? These are some of the ways in which <coughs> girls and boys get socialized to think of certain worlds as male domains and certain worlds as sort of not for women, right? Similarly, the, uh, there was also a finding that when women go into subjects such as science, technology, engineering, and medicine, and uh, mathematics, they encounter what's called a chilly classroom climate, which is actually somewhat similar to what we will be discussing a little later about Wikipedia and the culture of Wikipedia, where the, you know, that inhibits performance to some extent. And the third thing that I wanted to talk about is actually from childhood, women are often raised to sacrifice their own individual goals to sort of larger family goals or collective goals. The way this plays out again in poorer countries is if a family has limited resources, you know, an education in science is considered more expensive than an education in the humanities. And so the family will typically invest in the son over the daughter. So these are some of the things that are at the back of this. Now, the other thing is that's how it started, starts the gender gap. And here's how it actually continues. And I think time is a very, very important factor. So in feminist theory, there is a concept of the double burden. What the double burden actually talks about is that when women entered the workforce in large numbers earlier on, instead of seeing it as a positive thing, some women in feminism said that this is actually a negative because women are not able to give up their household responsibilities and they have to take on additional work responsibilities so it becomes a double burden. And I think, again, we got a good example this morning of how that's shifting and how you can now have a father doing the childcare, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> the other big internal problem when they tried to solve the STEM problem 
is that communities did not acknowledge the problem. Right? There was an imperviousness, and in that context, I'm deeply grateful to Wikimedia Israel for really looking at this squarely in the eye and saying this is something that we need to take on board and that it doesn't diminish us as Wikipedians, but it actually elevates us in taking something like this on board. Okay, now back at Wikipedia from STEM. I would like you all to actually read these two views of being a woman editor. The last line is just this one says, yeah, I'm one of those. those. Yeah, yeah, those. those, yes. And this says, yeah. The reason I'll just carry on if you've got the gist of it. The reason I want to show this to you because I think gender is a far more complicated thing and women are a far more complicated uh, sort of Category, yes, and we cannot dump all women into one category, right? Many of us feel deeply uncomfortable being sort of, you know, people who identify more with this, who really don't think of their gender as the primary thing online, will feel deeply uncomfortable going to women only editing workshops, etc., etc. Similarly, women who are a little more, you know, on this side, and I don't want to make it too black and white, will feel you know, that, they, that their gender is an important consideration in any sort of programs or policies. And what we do not want to do is we do not want to say, you are a real woman. You are not a real woman, right? We want to say, you are all women. And let's look at it from the way you experience Wikipedia. So I think the approach has to be nuanced not like one size fits all, like dump everybody into a box and try and do things. <coughs> the, okay, so building from that, we go to the question, is gender what keeps women away from editing? Or are there other factors or are there factors related to gender? This is actually an image of Sue Gardner, who's the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. The reason I put her photograph up is because I took these things from her blog. So one of them is the editing interface itself. Uh, people who, have tri who edit Wikipedia are comfortable with the editing interface. However, it can be a little alienating for a newcomer because it actually means looking at a lot of code. And for a lot of, you know, there's an interesting thing. If you look at the statistics of women users of social media across the world, you'll find that women are actually a little more than 50%. Yeah? And there, that interfa those interfaces of social media, etc., are very, very easy to use. Whereas this see, feels a little more geeky, a little more sort of one step removed. So that could be a problem for some women, but we can't say it's like for everybody a problem. And it could be a problem for some men as well. <coughs> Similarly, the too busy time thing we've gone into. Third is low self-confidence. Self Fourth is the culture. And fifth is that, again, from what we are seeing between use, uh, gender usage of social media and Wikipedia is that women like interacting. And again, everything is never about all women, right? Some women. But that is not necessarily, it's there in Wikipedia, but it's there in a slightly different form. So these are some of the things. Now, I want to go into two of these, which I think are particularly important. One is self-confidence. <coughs> we are not talking of self-confidence in the larger sense. Now we are talking of self-confidence with respect to knowledge. Women lack fun a fundamental sort of... Ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So women lack a fundamental sense of self-confidence when it comes to producing knowledge. Because again, due to the whole socialization, this, that, you know, all that stuff, and we see this in India a lot, women look on themselves as silent receivers of knowledge, not as producers. 
two things I'm going to tell you about. One is there have been many studies done in the United States on women and political knowledge. And they found that there's a gender gap. So they did a bunch of statistical surveys where they asked people to uh, tick off multiple choice answers on the political system, usually at the time of the elections. They found that there was a great gap between men's answers and women's answers. And what was the difference? Very interesting. Women were far more likely to tick don't know if that was given as an option. Whereas men, even if they didn't know, would take a chance and take something. I think that's fantastic. All the time. They don't know, but they are so sure about this. <laughs> so one of the suggestions in the US to measure, to enhance women's political knowledge is they're saying in these kinds of surveys, remove the don't know. So that it sort of pushes, you know, but it just, okay. second thing I want to tell you is actually a story from India. In India, I, uh, were in my day job, I work with a group of rural women who are journalists. And they're like community journalists. They don't have very much education, etc. When they started their newspaper, what do you think was the most difficult thing that they found to write in the newspaper? Any guesses? About Sorry? About Not about themselves, because that wasn't part of what they did at the newspaper. It was writing the editorial. Because again, the editorial is a sign of authority. It's a sign that your word counts, that your word has importance, right? Your knowledge, you, that your opinion, your point of view. They just found it incredibly difficult. They found it okay to report what other people were saying, but not their own stamp of authority. So that's one dimension. <coughs> the second part of it, and I think this is worth thinking about, is that you know, there are in our heads, just like there are many hierarchies, we also, if we're honest with ourselves, have hierarchies of knowledge. I had a long debate once with a Wikipedia editor in Sweden, where he said, well, the most valuable Wikipedia pages are the ones which get the most traffic. And I said, no, I don't agree with you. Because if we start thinking of knowledge like that in that hierarchy, then we will always devalue certain things which are not of interest to such a wide, right? It's like if you go to the article on Israel, it perhaps will get many, many more hits than, say, an article on this college. But does that mean that this college is not knowledge or is lesser knowledge? I don't think so. It's just different audiences, right? And this, again, is obviously a debatable point, because I can see some people smiling as well. But the thing is, well, what I want to say is that when we fall into these hierarchies, I think sometimes we tend to devalue the kinds of knowledge some women can bring. And I know that you, know, you immediately think of something like fashion, and you think, like, is this really knowledge? You think of something like cooking, and you think, is this really knowledge? And again, I don't want to fall into the stereotypical, but you know, sometimes we go the opposite way. And I also want to say that in traditionally, women have often been responsible for certain things such as agriculture, crops, nutrition in the family, and do possess knowledge. The problem is from a Wikipedia perspective, often those references do not exist in written form. These are oral citations, and there's a very good example from South Africa, where there's a very famous drink which is called Amarula, which is a liquor. Yes, very good. <laughs> yes, made from the Amarula berries, which are grown on the trees. Now, women make the entire thing, right? The whole chain of production. But these are women who are not necessarily literate who don't see themselves as producers or creators of knowledge. So even though they have the knowledge, there's what we would call a knowledge gap, where they themselves don't recognize that as knowledge. And neither would we at Wikipedia, frankly, without any references, etc., etc. I think for us also, it would be hard to recognize it as knowledge. So often, women's knowledge is also sort of tied to <coughs> oral cultures. OK, now that we're on the cultural point, again, Two female editors, these are the terms that were used about the culture of Wikipedia. These are two long-term editors, <coughs> none of whom has gone away from editing, 
Both of them are quite comfortable with the culture. But these are the terms that are used. And I think the only thing to recognize here is that everybody will not be comfortable with this culture. And again, this transcends gender. There will be many people who are men as well who will not be comfortable with this culture. But we know again from study after study that many women are really not comfortable with this. Yes. Talk a bit about the culture. Yes. <coughs> okay, I'll try and get to it in the next. So basically, let me, I'll very briefly try. Wow, 20 minutes left, right? Yes. Including question answers. Okay. So let me try and get to it then. So what do we mean? And actually, if there's anybody else in the room, because there are many Wikipedia editors, let me say, how does culture, how does the culture manifest itself? Okay. So if you are editing Wikipedia, the way you understand the culture, there's no like, you know, you get some guidelines and all that. You understand some of the sort of policies, etc. The way you understand the culture is actually you infer it. You start reading the lists, the mailing lists. You start looking at how people talk to each other. For each and every Wikipedia article, there is what's called a talk page or a discussion page. That's where editors talk to each other about that particular article, have discussions. Now, once that's where culture manifests itself. Right, and each Wikipedia, so there are 285 different language Wikipedias, <coughs> and each Wikipedia actually has what's called a village pump, sort of like a common place where people can post messages to each other, again, discuss things. Behind the, what we see. Sorry? That's what behind what we see. Yes, yes, yes. It's one layer behind you would have to. So there again, the culture manifests itself. Now, I will give you one example. If you were to go to the talk page, say I'll give you an Indian example. There is a mosque in India called the Babri Masjid, which was the source, um, the site actually, of very violent riots about 15 years ago. And the mosque was part of it was raised down by Hindu fundamentalists. Now, that is a very difficult page to edit because you have people who are coming in to edit that page who are Hindus, who are Muslims, who are Christians, I mean, just many people. And they're all coming in with different points of view. Where do they discuss? How does the page content actually get negotiated? On the discussion page. If you were to go to the discussion page, <coughs> I think for some people, they're comfortable with it. Right? Because you will see this. You will see that it is argumentative. People have to be able to discuss their different points of view and say, well, you, you should use this word because it's neutral. Right? So it is argumentative. It is discussive in that sense. And you know, people are human beings at the end of the day. It gets heated. Sometimes you get into a situation where you have a few editors strongly wedded to their points of view, really battling it out till consensus is reached. For me personally, I like it. I think it's actually more intellectually stimulating and it really makes you think and it's honest and it makes you probe your biases. Can you reach a consensus on a very, very uh, uh, political issue like Israel, for example? <coughs> Can one of y'all speak, draw Itzik, or what about like, is it possible to reach consensus on something like Israel? That's the way That's Sorry? Wrong. That's really wrong. Yeah, but like the page Israel. Actually, it's one of the most contentious yeah. pages, and there's a research that is going to be published in the new CSCW conference in two months from now. Okay. It's going to talk about the concept of Israel, which is, which is totally, it's a, it's a big mess in terms of controversy. It's different in the English speaking And different in the Hebrew. And they're probably, are they the same editors or some same, some different, right? Well, very yeah. Quiet. Yeah, and I guess in these kinds of situations, what happens is at some point consensus is reached and then those pages are semi-protected as we call them, right? I don't know if Israel is semi-protected, but there's a lock symbol mm -hmm. that you yes. see on certain pages where there's been so much discussion, so much debate that it's reached some equilibrium at this point. And people feel like now let it be there and let's not keep on and on sort of churning this up. So what I'm trying to say is that you can look at the word argumentative in two ways. You can look at it 
sort of from an intellectual learning point of view and say, yes, I too have my biases and this is a way to correct them. Or you can look at it and say, no, no, this is conflict, etc. And I think different people view it differently. And I also think different discussions are different. You know, sometimes you have something which is very restrained and only focusing on the topic. Sometimes people fly off the handle and start sort of saying things to each other. I want to say that uh, from my personal experience, even if it is intellectually uh, stimulating and challenging, and it's a good thing. It's very, very tiring. Yes. And when you're talking about women with the double vision, <coughs> they might want to have one experience like that or two experiences like that, but then they have to go and, 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 and do their own businesses. And, and it's very, very tiring. And I am, as a single man who doesn't have too many obligations, you're already feeling. I am completely tired. And that's after, let's say, yeah. five, six like that, I suppose that a woman with children would get worn yeah. out after one or two. And you're absolutely right. I think more than anything, it's emotionally draining. Yeah. Right? And you also, it's, you know, Wikipedia is a little addictive. Sometimes you get into these arguments, to say the least, right? You, yes. <laughs> you keep going back and, you know, you get in, it's like, it's like being part of a video game, frankly. You, you get into the gaming of it, right? So this is also the complexity, and I completely agree. I agree. But the thing is, wait, ah, one example I want to give you all on gender is there was an editor who wrote into the gender gap mailing list saying that in some of the articles, people are replacing the word rape with the word sex. Yeah, now I can hear from just the gasps in the room how frustrating to say the least, right, this is. But the thing is, the woman also wrote in saying, I just don't have the energy to like fight anymore, right? And to keep <laughs> on and on and on. And sometimes I think it gets very difficult to maintain that sort of neutral, supposedly in the interests of an objective encyclopedia, when you sort of know that this is rape but you have to somehow put it in that frame of knowledge and it can and find some reference i mean it can be an highly time consuming to say the least <coughs> now a very interesting theory actually is joseph regal was the keynote speaker at wikimania in haifa which is where i got this image from and he spoke about something different there but he actually compared the culture at Wikipedia to the, what's called the f culture of floss, of free and uh, open software, right? FOSS or floss. And he felt that the two are very, very similar. So one of the things is, we know now if we look at it in terms of numbers, that about 27% of women in the United States are in computer-related jobs. But if we look at the FLOSS numbers, only 1.1% of FLOSS participants are actually women. So it's much, much lower, right? Who are working on <coughs> software, or free and open source software. Yeah. What is FLOSS again? So uh, what is the L? Free and, I know FOSS is free and open source software. Free, L is usually Libre, but I don't know what it means. Yeah. So FOSS is usually free and open source software, uh, as opposed to proprietary software. Uh, yeah. Free Libre open source. Yeah, so free Libre open source software, right? Yeah. <coughs> so the thing is, you know, his theory is that basically people who work in FOSS are software coders. They write code. And his theory, which is very interestingly explained, is that People who write code in for, through the like through FOSS or write free and open source software code. I'm sorry, I'm doing this badly. <laughs> they have certain identities, and that identity can very often be quite similar to the Wikipedia identity, which is very obsessive. You can get obsessed with <laughs> ending a piece of code. You know, you want the classic image is of the software coder who is at the computer writing code, which is also an abstraction and a form of poetry at some level. 
and loses himself completely in it, forgets to eat or there's like around the computer, there's like food all over and it's very messy and you know, everything is happening but it's the coat. Yeah, so that's a particular kind of false geek identity which a lot of women can't relate to. Did you want to say something? Sorry, okay. Uh, the other thing is he also says that open communities, you know, just like we have open knowledge, which is what Wikipedia promotes, we also have open software, we have open educational resources, all of which are trying to take away the proprietary element of all these things. His theory is that open communities tend to attract a certain kind of person um, who can really destabilize the culture, right? And I think many of us who've been on wiki lists, mailing lists, will privately acknowledge that sometimes we see, you know, some names and we are like, oh my God, this is like never going to end. Because, you, yeah, because you know that this is now going to become like an endless sort of trolling thing, right? Okay, similarly, this is a very interesting point. He says that freedom and openness are double-edged swords because freedom is defined from a particular point of view. And the best example of this is actually on Wikipedia, there was a lot of discussion, and I don't know where I myself stand on this, but there were a lot of discussions about sexualized images, nude images, usually of women, which on the one hand, you could argue, certainly, that many of them have educational value <coughs> and are part of knowledge. All, on the gender gap mailing list, we have a lot of discussion on how some of these images are completely inappropriate and should be taken off a knowledge repository like Wikipedia. But the discussion then becomes that you are, if you take this image off, you are then restricting my knowledge. my knowledge and my freedom of speech. Yeah, and that's why I'm saying I don't know quite where I stand on this because I also think that we need to have a very wide variety of knowledge and we cannot sort of start censoring images and, you know, text in the name of protecting people because frankly what we are then doing is restricting knowledge. But his theory is that that in turn can be freedom defined from a particular point of view and it can restrict somebody else's comfort within that space. Similarly, when we say openness, I'll just one sec. You know, we often, when we talk of openness, we talk of open source, open knowledge, or open education. But sometimes we also need to think of open minds and have like a certain amount of that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and the solution we found yeah. is still using is hiding some of the <coughs> not deleting them, not uh, avoiding the use of them, but hiding them so that only people who want to use to, to see it uh, can just click on the unhide. And then so how do you hide them? That's interesting. Just close it. Close it like a sh yeah. Okay, so this is very interesting because I just want to say for people who are not from the world of Wikipedia that the... And then there's also, there's also the discussion if to hide or not to hide a certain image yeah, we'll regarding any specific image. I would make a comment that the YouTube does the safety mode, okay? So the safety mode, for instance, uh, the comments for the video are hidden. Yes. And for a person that you often even if the video is nice, comments may not be and there's nothing to control the person who uploaded the video. So if you put the view on safety mode and all the comments are hidden and you have to do unhide to see the comments. So this is how I do with my kids, you know, I have to do on safety mode. So this is actually a complicated thing in the Wikipedia, uh, Wikimedia universe because we've had many discussions about whether we should put in personal user choice filters where nothing is removed from the sites, meaning nothing is permanently taken away, which is what I understand as censorship. But these are community-based decisions. And again, you know, the Hebrew, Hebrew Wikipedia has taken a particular decision. I, I'm not sure that English Wikipedia would necessarily <laughs> take the same decision, right? And that's what it means to be part of a crowdsourced knowledge repository. 
but this is what also makes some so this was you know the category somebody wrote this letter to a list saying can someone please explain to me why category nude portrayals of computer technology even exists how is a category like this whatever about the image remotely encyclopedic or useful to the project etc populated with sexualized images of women almost all naked or semi naked i am a computer engineer myself given the drive to get more women involved in stem fields i see stuff like this as being really damaging and this is just one single example i'm just putting this up here not because we can resolve it now but again you will have many women who will disagree with this and you will have many and that's we always have to come back to that right okay now similarly the sexualization thing this is certainly something that this is again an interview with a long term wikipedia user who personally encountered verbal abuse etc etc in a gendered sense right where people were discussing her appearance the clothes she wore whether she feared being raped bras she wore etc etc <coughs> which i see as highly gendered because people are not sitting and discussing this about male editors and this happens to women in politics a lot in the world at large or women in sort of high positions they're often complaining that they don't get serious taken seriously enough as professionals that people will ask them questions about like what lipstick do you use you know that kind of thing which makes them feel that they're like they're being looked at through this gendered lens okay i think there's just a couple more uh this is an interesting example i just thought i would put it in cartoon form because there was a case recently of an american novelist called amanda filippacci who woke up one morning and saw that she was no longer in the wikipedia category called american novelists but that she and many other women whose names began with a or b had been moved to american women novelists but this is not as simple as it sounds because when you look at it from the outside the media did a huge sort of thing saying this is sexist okay i would actually argue that the intent behind this was not sexist the intent behind this was actually to categorize knowledge so the page on american novelists already had but the effect may have been sexist right so we have to also think of intent and effect but this is i want to discuss this a bit the person who <laughs> after me yeah the person who edited this actually you know there was like some 3000 names on the american novelists page and of course it's clumsy to take gender as a category and try and move women away from american novelists only to american women novelists because then you get left only with men in the american novelists big problem you yeah, go ahead say something you know i think this is the whole thing about categorization and politics and categorization they look at the us united states how they categorize people that are not like yellow people got it yellow people like today if you think about it what it means i mean this is a, like really not politically correct so really when you look at categories this is the the basic politics of sexism or whatever because it hides all the different values that you embed inside right so 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 when you say that that it's it's not really sexist yes he didn't say he said about that but it it brings with itself the guy from the wings that the trade of this whole category it brings with him a whole value system that is embedded with the way that he Okay, let me take this a little further and then I'll come to you, which is, you know, there are two I've read a lot about this and I have to say I'm still see one is we believe at Wikipedia if you look at the guidelines on categorization there's a concept called diffusion. So it basically says that you cannot move somebody out of a parent category. Suppose you think of American novelists as a parent category, you can't move anybody out of that and put them exclusively into the sub category. but yeah but the thing is uh, it also says that the best solution is to have both categories and i'll tell you why because frankly sometimes even i mean i'm a woman and i'm a filmmaker and i get very irritated when people say 
like would put me into woman filmmaker category. I, it really, because I feel like, think of the genre, I'm a documentary filmmaker, put me in that. Similarly with literature, <coughs> they tried to put everybody, men, women, everybody into like genre, which is again subjective to some extent. They tried to put people by century, 1800s, 1900s, etc. But the thing is, they, uh, the complication here is that I agree, it is about the politics of categorization. The policy very clearly says that you should only use related categories, right? Like genre rather than gender. But the truth is that, you know, gender is also a useful category. So as long as it stays in the parent category, you sometimes have researchers who are doing their PhDs or their masters on American women novelists and won that category also. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that the category is not the word uh, American male novel. Yeah, category. agreed. This is, this, this is like, it's like I was talking to teaching the student about uh, Miss, Mrs, Mr, Mrs. Mrs. Yeah. Mr. 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 And I told her, look, this is sexist, it's, it's not relevant. Why? Because there isn't, I don't know if a mister is married or not, so this is, and it's exactly the same. It has to be the same. Once it's the same, and the main category, American novelist includes equally all the subcategories, which one is yeah. American main novelist, then you can say that the intent is pure, etc., etc., and it's not, doesn't have the effect that we are talking about. But this is, uh, this is, this is, this is terrible, you know, I'm, uh, this, this, I'm, t I'm talking as a, you know, I only have one, one uh, article that I wrote, and I'm now working my second article. This, this is, this is but can I just say one thing? I agree with you that there should be both male and women, female. But the thing is, and maybe this is the slide I want to get to, is you know I don't see it as sexism. Actually, I see it as what's called androcentrism, honestly. And I uh, now I feel like a Wikipedian, like sitting and you know nitpicking on words. <laughs> but the thing is. Uh, I think because I came from the women's movement, I often found that we use words sometimes a little too lightly. You know, we are very quick to label behaviors. And when we are talking about classification, the one slide that I didn't put in and I wish I had done now is, has anyone ever seen the classification written by the Latin American writer Jorge Luis Borges? called the something, the extraordinary classification of celestial beings, where he basically makes a list, which according to him is a list of animals made by a Chinese emperor. It's on uh, Wikipedia. I, I thought it would just take it in a different direction and left it out. And basically has all sorts of things that we would never recognize as categories, right? So it says like an animal with three yellow legs, an animal. So it's his way of showing that categorization at some level is also not as objective as it sounds and is again something that needs to be negotiated but i would really say that you know i think the issue that we are dealing with culturally at wikipedia more than sexism is actually androcentrism which is the practice conscious or otherwise of placing male human beings or the masculine point of view at the center and that is perhaps why for the person American male novelist was not a category at all, right? Because it seems like the man should be an American novelist and only the woman should have a separate category. But uh, just something to keep in mind. Okay, I'm almost at the end. There's just a couple of things and then I wanted to show one last video, which is we can have a discussion about this. Where do we go from here? <coughs> I've, yeah, this is the, I'll show this last actually. You know, the key thing is to really ensure that women write up the worlds that they know and they inhabit. And we've done a bunch of things already at within the Wikiverse. So one is I think people took it seriously. I think Sue, who's the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation, took it very seriously, wrote a bunch of blog posts, talked to people, set up a mailing list called Gender Gap. And I wish somebody, somebody who's a sociologist does a study of the tone on the gender gap list and the tone on what we call the Wikimedia list because that shows gender very, very starkly. It's really like a different atmosphere. 
<coughs> Similarly, that photograph is of Sarah Stearch, who came on board as a gender gap fellow for a year and put into place a lot of initiatives that helped slowly change the culture bit by bit by bit. One is we started a project called Project Tea House on English Wikipedia, where if you came in as a new editor, you could, you know, you would be met by some volunteer editors who were specially trained to be more friendly, more welcoming. Yes, so that you wouldn't suddenly get a notice on your talk page saying, you know, if you're a newcomer and the first notice you get is, your article has been deleted for the following 10 reasons. How are you going to proceed to the next article? You're not, right? If chances are, yeah. Similarly, they started something called Wiki Women's Collaborative on Facebook and on Twitter to again integrate that social interaction thing. <coughs> again, a lot of editathons were done all over the world. I think somewhere in Israel as well, we did some in India, where we had a very intriguing article actually by a new editor who wrote about something called sari cancer, which we had never heard about. So, you know, Indian women wear saris. And the sari in humid, hot India chafes against this part of your skin because you sort of tuck it in. And that apparently has given rise to a particular form of cancer, which is called sari cancer loosely, because it comes from that. Weird, right? I was like, I can't believe this actually exists. But yes, the sort of evidence is there. Uh, and then there's, you know, many, many things still left to be done. I'm just going to end by saying two things. One is, this is an image of Ada Lovelace who was the world's first computer programmer. I put it up there because I thought, how can you ever look at this image and think <laughs> that this woman is a computer programmer? But she was. She was the world's first computer programmer. She, I, because I'm very interested in literature, she was also the daughter of a very famous poet called Lord Byron. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of we can have a discussion, but I think one of the things we really need to do <coughs> is try and understand the issue better. So for instance, it, you know, we say these, these are the factors, but we don't know that these are the factors in all the Wikipedias, right? So for instance, in some of the Indian language Wikipedias, and there are 20 of them, we may not have this kind of culture. The culture may be somewhat different. So I think one of the things going forward is for us to really do actually what Wikimedia Israel has started doing which is you try and understand the problem. Now you have sort of the global context. Try and understand it in your own local context. Try and understand what is out of all these factors. Which is the one that's most important? You know, do sort of qualitative conversations, et cetera, et cetera. Try and come to some sort of understanding. And I think local solutions will actually get us there. And I have to say that one of the fun, most fantastic local solutions I encountered this morning was when I met a woman called Seema. There you are, yeah. And I was talking to her and she said that they, she lives in the north of Israel and that they have a little editing group of a few women who meet once every two weeks or a month or something. And every second Monday. Every second Monday. And sort of, you know, have a nice time, have a discussion, edit what they want, etc., etc. And I personally think, you know, the, the world was created, change is like to sort of quote Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, is that if you have a small group of committed individuals, you can sort of change the world step by step. So just want to say that that was the most inspiring thing and thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. You want to show the video? Is it necessary? Yeah. I like the feeling when I'm staying in the forest. It's quiet. You can listen to the birds, to the, to the trees. I got my degree in botany. If I'm not taking botany, I might think that these trees are all the same. They are green, they are trees, they don't have name, but actually they do. I found it's great <laughs> working in the forest. My name is Kwet Meijun, I'm from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia.
I'm working in an agriculture institution. I contribute images to Wikimedia Commons and I contribute images on crop species and mainly on neglected and underutilized crops. We want to engage our partners, researchers and scientists to contribute to Wikipedia. Most of the time, they are good pictures um, captured by researchers, by scientists on crop species, but they put it in their personal external hard disk, they put it in their institution repositories, and that we found it is better for us to put them in a public repositories where everyone can see, everyone can use. We do not want the publications to be sitting on a shelf or only disseminate a few physical uh, copies to our partners only. We want readers to access images. I believe uh, in the agriculture community or in the researcher community, they are not aware of the potential with working in Wikipedia. We want to make it the ultimate database of crops. Mm, nice. Yeah. Should I wait for questions? How oh, do you we have about two minutes for questions, okay. so we have time for one question, if it's short, or maybe okay. two questions. Shall we wait? Readers. On the readers. I don't think we have a gender breakup. Users. Is there a gender breakup? Yeah. See, what I know, and actually, good question, I will keep this kind of data ready next time, is we have almost 500 million users now all over the world. I have not seen, as far as I know, the user statistics are much more closely balanced. But I, don't, I honestly can't. I'll have to look it up. Yeah. Editors. My sense is, but I will have to check it, is that we don't really have a, we don't have a gender gap that is significant in users, okay, as far as I know. But I will check and see if I can get the de details. I would suggest that you point this question to the expert panel after lunch, because they did do some research on this in Israel. Great. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more question. Last question. No questions? Okay, so 15 minutes break. break.